Hello and welcome everyone to the Carnegie Global Dialogue organized by Carnegie China. I'm Lisa Bomasi, Deputy Director of Carnegie Europe in Brussels, and I'm thrilled to be joined by a distinguished panel today, Dr. Alice Ekman and Dr. Ding Yifan, to discuss the future of China-Europe relations. For those who are not familiar with the Carnegie China Global Dialogue series, these events consist of panel discussions examining China's evolving foreign policy from the perspective of Carnegie scholars and experts from across the globe and at each of our global centers. This panel is the third of 2024, our last two discussions focused on China and the Pacific Islands and China and Central Asia. For those who want to rewatch or re-listen to previous sessions, you can access those on the Carnegie Endowments website. Turning to today's discussion, I'd like to start by introducing our panel. Dr. Alice Ekman is a senior analyst in charge of the Asia portfolio at the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris. She covers foreign policy and security developments in the Asian region and manages regular track 1.5 dialogues with the EU's regional partners. Alice was formerly head of China research at the French Institute of International Relations IFRI in Paris. She has published several critically acclaimed books on China's ideological renewal, China's foreign policy orientations under Xi Jinping, and most recently on the China-Russia rapprochement. Welcome, Alice. And of course, we have Dr. Ding Yifan, who is the president of the China Society for France Studies and senior fellow and deputy director of the Institute of World Development under the State Council's Development Research Center in Beijing. Alongside a distinguished list of affiliations in China, he is also a member of the Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs and was vice president of the China Society for World Economics. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Bordeaux and has been a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. Welcome, Professor Ding. Today's discussion will focus on Beijing's evolving relationship with Europe and the shifts we've seen over the past few years. China, for example, became Europe's largest trading partner in 2020, yet by 2022, the EU had a massive trade deficit with China, almost 400 billion euro, which by some estimates had doubled over the past two years. So it is in many ways natural that the relationship is largely characterized by economic dynamics. Geopolitically, though, relations um, have come under considerable strain since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has soured ties between Brussels and Beijing. And we've seen a host of retaliatory tit-for-tat sanctions on accusations of China's human rights record. Yet in December last year, the first in-person EU-China summit since 2019 took place in Beijing, signaling, at least on paper, a willingness to engage at the highest level and pursue a more constructive dialogue. Certainly there are areas of shared common interest, especially on global challenges like climate change and health. Our discussion today will explore those shifting dynamics and we're very fortunate to have with us Alice Ekman and Ding Yifan. I'd like to begin with the Chinese uh, perspective. Um, Professor Ding, in your view, what are China's goals and ambitions in Europe and how do you see the China-Europe relationship evolving in the years to come? You've written quite extensively, for example, on the dangers of de-risking or decoupling, which are tied to Europe's agenda on strategic autonomy. And at uh -huh. the same time, you've also noted the shifting dynamics, especially in the global South and China's place therein and how that might affect Europe. Professor Deng, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. So my topic uh, this evening or this afternoon is uh, China and Europe are in the trap of mistrust. So the mistrust is the main reason why uh, our relations was not uh, moving so smoothly towards a future, uh, a, a brilliant future. So this year, in 2024, the theme of a global economic forum in Davos was rebuild trust. It's because if the Davos wanted to promote the building of the rebuilding of the trust is because mainly in the global theater. So all these uh, big players don't have any trust with each other. So that's why uh, without any trust between all these big players, 
the global economy uh, might uh, be sliding into a sort of uh, long-term stagflation, if not shrinkflation, because Financial Times just published papers about a more uh, gloomy picture of global economy, talking that we may be dragged into a, a shrinkflation. It's more serious than stagflation because stagflation, the growth is stagnant. Well, if the growth is shrinking while the inflation is not totally controlled, the situation will be worse. So that's how we can analyze today's situation. So I won't be so long about this topic. So I will focus mainly on four po five points. First of all, origin of the tension between Europe and China. Those can track back can be tracked back to the 2019 uh, report of European Union about China. In 2019, European Union issued a report about China, it's a China policy. And then for the first time, the U European report, European Union report described China as a partner of cooperation, but a competitor in the market and a systemic rival. So that's the first time that China has been described by European Union as a systemic rival. Since then, if we look at the, the we look into the report, uh, the sphere of cooperation is very limited. It's only global climate change. Only in the sector of a global climate change, there is some possibility of cooperation between Europe and China. So there's only minimal sectors. So China was very disappointed about this report, about the definition of China by a uh, European report on China. But China wanted also to reach some consensus and some cooperation with Europe. So in the international arena, China didn't blame Europe for any issue. China wanted leaders of China still talk about common interest with Europe, with the European Union. And they always put the emphasis on the fact that there is no geopolitical, fundamental geopolitical conflicts between Europe and China. So uh, we should not have these kind of so-called uh, systemic rivalries. So that's the first point. Despite the qualification by the European Union, Chinese leaders still wanted to maintain good relations with Europe and didn't reply to Europe's definition uh, so seriously. The second point that after years of efforts by uh, Angela Merkel, so former uh, German chancellor, China and the European Union reached by, pers by her personal efforts, he persuaded all these European Union members to concluded this agreement with China on bilateral investment, CAI, Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. So uh, that was very, very important agreement between China and Europe because China wanted to give some advantage by opening its market to European enterprises by this agreement. But we know that Rapidly, this agreement between China and European Union has been tossed aside because European Union have accused China. The European Union has accused uh, China of violation of human rights in Xinjiang. And then some government official in Xinjiang has been sanctioned by European Union's decisions. Then Chinese government took some retaliation measures, sanctioning also some European officials. So that's why those uh, agreements, those very important agreements between Europe and China have been suspended because of this. 
so uh, we wanted to push up and to bring a closer economic cooperation between China and Europe has been failed to literally have been failed because of these. So that's, that's how we didn't reach uh, some agreement despite all these efforts by uh, some European politicians and by the Chinese leaders. So the third point that the mistrust between China and European Union start, that started in 2019 had been reinforced by Ukrainian war. Of course, when Biden came to power, he, Biden administration wanted to build up a sort of transatlantic coalition of democracies. So he wanted to put China and Russia into the same basket. So they wanted to create a confrontation between a coalition of a democracy against uh, a, a coalition of authoritarianism. So that uh, makes the things very complicated, very, very complicated. Although China never recognized Russians' behavior in Crimea or in the eastern part of Ukraine, China didn't blame Russia for its military actions because China always considered these events much more complicated than its appearance. We said that behind all these military actions, there is a fact that Russia has been forced to the corner by NATO's uh, successive enlargement and uh, a lot of treatment of Russia by Western countries. So uh, China cannot afford to blame Russia as Western countries. And though this Chinese attitude considered as ambiguous by Europeans, um, are, to some extent, this attitude has been interpreted as a tacit support behind Russia. So uh, every declaration of Chinese government about Ukrainian war uh, has been considered as unfair and unjust by European public opinions. So because they didn't blame Russia for this. So that's why uh, this Ukrainian war has reinforced this mistrust between Europe and China. The fourth point is that pandemic have also bring down our trust. Actually, the COVID pandemic is the global health issue. So logically, we should reinforce our cooperation in this. But Chinese friendly behavior with, with regard to Europe has been interpreted as a diplomacy of masks because China has sent those masks to Europe, to a lot of European countries, all these uh, has been interpreted as a uh, mask diplomacy. So, and then all of a sudden, many European countries realized that they have a lot of dependency on China. So they said that we are too dependent on China. Uh, that caused uh, uh, some vulnerability vulnerability in, in European markets. So they wanted to be decoupled from China. And the process of decoupling has not been initiated by Europe, but by the United States. Since Trump administration, um, the United States wanted to be decoupled from China because they said that globalization was only in favor of China. So they wanted to uh, reverse the, global, uh, the globalization process. They wanted to engage a sort of a deglobalization. And then in the process of deglobalization, they wanted to uh, decouple their economy completely from China. But as the pandemic happened, so 
more and more uh, millionaire states depend on China for a variety of uh, industrial products to face up to these kind of uh, urgency issues in the middle of the pandemic. So during the pandemic period of time, the US trade deficit with China, instead of declining, is rising. So uh, it is completely unfeasible with those kind of uh, decoupling. That's why uh, European Union, so uh, Madame von der Leyen, have invented the notion of the risky because Europe also following Americans uh, decoupling efforts with China. So they wanted also to be, to have a more balanced relationship with China. So they, want, they, they wanted to de, de, de risk. So to reduce the ex exposure to China, uh, to Chinese, uh, meeting China to a certain extent. Well, after Europe invented the word de-risking, so uh, Biden administration picked up notion of the risking. So at the G7 summit and many other international cooperation uh, forums. So the United States are talking uh, with uh, the risking as well as Europeans. Well, the global supply chain has been built for more than 20 years in the middle of the globalization. So nowadays, if people wanted to use the pretext of the risking to cut off the global supply chain, it will involve a huge crisis. It will involve a huge crisis. So nowadays, Western countries cannot bring back all these manufacturing sectors to to West, to Europe, or to the United States. It's impossible. That's why the United States have found another pretext. This time, the, the, the invention of the new concept is French shoring. French shoring means that they wanted to move out of China some of those, of those manufacturing sectors for those countries considered as safe or friendly, as safe or friendly, like uh, uh, Vietnam, like Mexico, like India. So they wanted to dislocate those uh, Western uh, production chain from China to all these countries. But obviously, if those countries didn't have the whole complete supply chain as China did, so uh, they still rely heavily on China imported uh, spare parts or components or, or compo all these things. Uh, some New York University's economists had made uh, investigation about import from uh, Vietnam and Mexico to the United States. And they discovered that more than 70% of these components of the final manufacturing goods are from China. So because these manufacturing factories in Vietnam, in Mexico, have to import all the, the majority of the uh, components from China before assembling into a final manufactured goods to import, to export to the US market. So that's how all these will to some extent, all these process, those friendly shoring, will rise, will raise the, the production cost, and will reduce the efficiency in the production. So that will exert some inflationary pressure over the market in the United States and in, in to some extent in Europe also. So it is not very, very uh, valuable practice. So the five points. The fifth point is that this kind of mistrust 
will have a negative impact on the global supply chain. So in everywhere where we can engage further cooperation have been fragmented. So the efficiency has been reduced. So uh, the global economy, the prospect of global economy is, uh, is not very brilliant. Europe wanted to take advantage of the Ukrainian crisis to accelerate its transformation from fossil fuel to renewable energy. So in this regard, theoretically, there is a lot of potential of cooperation between China and Europe because China is the biggest provider of these uh, renewable energy equipments in every sector. China is the biggest uh, provider of these renewable energy equipments. But because of this mistrust, most of Europeans doesn't want to, most of the Europeans don't want to uh, push forward this cooperation with China because they, they said that Europe cannot afford to be dependent on China as they were dependent on Russia's cheap oil. So they, they cannot rely on China's uh, provision of these uh, uh, cheap renewable energy equipments to build their uh, renewable energy bases for these uh, sectors. So some European countries uh, are expressing their decisions to not to stick to the target of carbon neutrality. So in China, we look at these decisions with a lot of disappointment because Europe has been considered as a champion of, uh, to fight with climate change, to promote uh, carbon neutrality, carbon emission, carbon neutrality. Well, today, with all these geopolitical events, all these uh, uh, mistrust, so Europe is ready to give up their target of carbon neutrality. So, the last news I read is that Germany has decided just to shut down the last panel solar manufacturing company. So there is no 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 factories for uh, panel solar uh, producing in 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 Germany. So this last one. So so. Uh, the, the last news just showed how the mistrust is made between China and Europe. In Singapore, there is a, a, a an exhibition on, on air forces, on, on airplanes. And there is a, a military transport aircraft made by Airbus. So there is a lot of visitors they want. In Singapore, we know that as we have decided to open our border with Singapore, so there is no visa between China and Europe uh, and Singapore. So a lot of Chinese tourists are in Singapore. When those Chinese visitors wanted to visit this military transport aircraft, they have been refused by the organizer. They said that no, visitors with Chinese and Russian passport cannot visit these uh, transport aircraft. So Chinese visitors have been refused to visit. So uh, they complained, of course, they complained. So and then Air, uh, Airbus headquarters decided to open it. They informed their guests in Singapore that the Chinese visitors can visit these. So starting from today, so Chinese visitors can, uh, Chinese visitors are allowed to visit those uh, transport uh, aircraft again. But a simple fact like this showed there is a deep mistrust between Europe 
and China. So that's why ordinary Chinese visitors have been the victim of these kind of mistrust. So to, to come to my end, my conclusion is that the mistrust between China and Europe will bring the global economy into a long-term stagflation because the global supply chain built for 20 years uh, have been fragmented. So that will create uh, much trouble, both in Europe and uh, China. China is facing a serious problem of economy growth slow, slowing down. So that will cause a lot of problems uh, as employment and, and so on and so forth. While Europe is facing the same problem also. If you look at the economic growth, it's stagnant, it's almost stagnant. Well, these kind of stagnation of economic growth will make the situation worse for those kind of ethnic group conflicts. Ethnic group conflicts will be aggravated because of this economic growth stagnation. And then farmers are unhappy because they said that the promised subsidy from their respective government has been reallocated for different other purposes. So farmers are unhappy, they are in streets. So to some extent, this mistrust caused mainly by those geopolitical calculus cannot solve the problem of these political elites in Europe. So we should reconsider our relationship. We should find out some way of rebuilding the trust. So then if we can rebuild some trust between China and Europe, uh, the trust will be the basis for further cooperation, technological economic cooperation. And then we can get out of this mess jointly. So we can only get off this global economy stagflation, this mess uh, jointly, not individually. So that's my conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Ding. That's a very uh, rich and complex landscape that you have painted for us. Um, Alice, I know that you uh, have thoughts on this. Um, you've written a lot about this uh, challenge of ambiguity. You had a book that came out that year that looked specifically at China's relationship with Russia. Um, could you give us your thoughts on, on, on that, please? Sure, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lisa, for the invitation and to Carnegie Europe. And um, I, uh, I listened to Professor Ding's presentation with uh, great interest. We have one point of convergent, uh, convergence. We agree that there is uh, currently mistrust between the EU and China, and Europe and China as a whole. But uh, we strongly disagree on the chronology of uh, this uh, mistrust process. Um, Professor Ding, you uh, point at 2019 as a starting point um, of of main mistress, you know, uh, process, uh, pointing specifically at EU's uh, China policy and uh, and the conceptualization of better relationship under the triptych now well known uh, competitor uh, partner, but also systemic rival. Mm -hmm. But as a um, researcher working specifically on China, I saw systemic rivalry shaped by Xi Jinping himself already in 2013. He uh, uh, declared in front of uh, senior party cadres that uh, he believed in the uh, superiority of, of communism over capitalism and the ultimate victory of communism over capitalism in the long term. We may disagree on the definition of communism or capitalism, but it is clear 
under Xi Jinping more than under Hu Jintao, uh, that the uh, Chinese government uh, see its model as its political system, as um, being uh, in competition with uh, liberalism and capitalism as a whole, and that China has been trying pretty hard to position itself as, a, as an example to the developing world and to other countries in the world, an example to learn from in terms of political reform, economic system, etc. The systemic rivalry is, has been framed in pretty clear terms since 2013 up to now. And I would say that China, as, as you know, as we all know, China under Xi Jinping is not the same as the China under the Hu Jintao era. Uh, it has changed and this evolution domestically, but on in terms of foreign policy orientation led to a uh, form of mistrust from part of the world, including in Europe. Um, many uh, observers, nice of China, were very surprised to see how fast the hardening of the domestic political system uh, became a reality. Um, and also how it became harder also for our foreign companies to do business in China. Market access has always been a, a point of tension in the bilateral relationship. But uh, putting government aside, when you look at the European Chamber of Commerce and the report, uh, uh, European Chamber of Commerce being in Beijing and the, and the feedbacks from my experience from my various foreign companies, you have a new perspective uh, about, you know, about the uh, bureaucratic but also political limits uh, in doing business with China. And more broadly, you also had a different approach to um, not only um, research unit, think tank, uh, foreign NGOs in China or media, but also a, a more, I would say, a cautious um, and I would say critical approach towards foreigners in general. You know, the mere anecdote, the fact that you there is a hotline in China that you can call when you see a suspicious, suspicious Westerner in the street. This, this, you know, adds to an, a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, emphasis on uh, on being very careful about uh, foreigners on the Chinese territory that they are potentially all spies and that uh, they need to be. Uh, watch closely. This had, a, no, it, it led to a new atmosphere, not just a political diplomatic atmosphere, but business atmosphere, that led to mistrust. If uh, if uh, uh, you have the impression that uh, you know, uh, Western in particular can be Western hostile forces that need to be denounced uh, to the uh, uh, security apparatus, then how to build trust in this uh, atmosphere? And the atmosphere of fear has been also. Um, observable in China within the party system and even within the think tank system, the way uh, counterparts are exchanging, presenting their views is very different from the Hu Jintao era. Um, same very well-trained, clever people, but very different way to interact and present their views, but also we interact with foreigners, especially with foreigners that are considered as Westerners. Uh, we heard a lot about the wolf wire diplomacy, but in, in a nutshell and beyond this term that is controversial, what is clear is that under Xi Jinping, um, the party considered that it's time, it's time now for the West to shut up, that China has been humiliated for too long by Western countries, by the US and allies. And now not only Western counterparts should not raise any doubt, criticism, or, you know, comment about China, but China should respond immediately and systematically to criticize, comment back any uh, any uh, Western hostile forces or proceed such. This is pretty clear in the interaction. So how to build or to rebuild trust in this atmosphere is the, very difficult. To a point that sometimes some of the some of the EU China summit has been uh, labeled as dialogue of the deaf is this just from the beginning it's very difficult to agree on the description of the fact on the on the situation on the ground being in Ukraine being in the Middle East or being uh, at political level in our respective country the mistrust came also from a, one point that you alluded to Professor Ding at the end of your very interesting presentation. You referred to uh, tension with farmers, uh, which is a reality in France. You referred to ethnic group conflict. I'm not sure how, you know, how you, what you refer to, but in general term, what you say is what you you just said is very common. We we heard over the last ten years constant 
comment on the weaknesses of our political system, of our society, of our economy, uh, under a more general frame of the Western decline. Uh, Chinese official uh, communication is very clear that the West is in decline, and not only it is in decline, China is on the rise. And, um, you know, it's time for China to size um, the opportunity to rise further uh, because uh, the West is in bad shape. And whenever uh, a partner from a perceived West is raising a comment or critics about a uh, situation in China, uh, quickly um, weaknesses of the West are underlined. So I understand that you, you mentioned Chinese uh, friendly behavior towards Europe during the pandemic, but it was perceived very differently here. Um, when uh, China um, kindly uh, donated or exported uh, protection equipment, it was after Europe did the same to China, but in a very uh, in a very different term, you know, much more discreetly Europe did so, whereas China did so, um, in a frame of very active uh, communication strategy that underlines the weaknesses of the West, that uh, alluded to the lack of solidarity among EU member states, that Italy was alone and that the EU was not helping, and you had a whole communication strategy around it that led uh, HRVP Jose Borrell to talk about a battle of narratives. So that's our perception, and this battle of narrative was also felt individually within member states when you have uh, ambassadors who are uh, in, you know, in. Uh, public communication underlining or pointing at the bad management of the pandemic in the countries they are posted to in a very direct, direct, uh, very uh, offensive term. Of course, it's hard to see uh, Chinese friendly behavior towards Europe uh, during the pandemic. And most of all, the fact that uh, China uh, pointed at the US as being responsible for the pandemic itself that would have been generated by a military lab in the US purposely to destabilize China for the, for us, this is the, the, the end of credibility. Um, how can you build trust when you, we are so far away from facts and uh, uh, close to uh, disinformation and manipulation operation that, uh, that our democracies are fighting for on a regular basis? So, Mistrust here is a reality. I fully agree with you. I think it's originally back to 2013, but I agree with you that um, uh, the pandemic has accelerated it, that uh, also European China policy um, was a turning point in terms of, uh, I would say, our interaction and the fact that the systemic rivalry has been acknowledged, I think, on both sides. And I also agree with you that uh, in Russia's invasion of Ukraine was a turning point because we have totally different views of, um, of the reason and motivation and steps um, uh, toward the conflicts and uh, the fact that not only China did not condemn uh, Russia and still has never since uh, today, but uh, strongly supported Russia since invasion in terms of reinforced economic cooperation, reinforced energy cooperation, uh, constant diplomatic support up to the point when uh, Vladimir Putin was uh, welcomed as a guest of honor during the last Belt and Road uh, Forum that took place in uh, Beijing in October, or that uh, Minister of Defense Shoigu was also one of the keynote speakers of the Shangshan Forum uh, held uh, two weeks after. All this uh, point at the fact that uh, Russia-China strategic coordination, as both leaders are calling for, is uh, something planned long term. It's serious, it's deep down, it's much more than a simple marriage of convenience. And for us, of course, it, this, uh, this generates a lot of. Um, question and mistrust again. Uh, you mentioned the fact that, uh, I quote, Europe wanted to take advantage of the Ukraine crisis as if we were <laughs> enjoying the situation and, and you know, opportunistically uh, trying to, to, to take advantage of, of it from one reason or other, as, as Chinese media also accused the US of, uh, of uh, making money out of, uh, out of the war. Uh, first of all, and we, we <laughs> did not uh, won this war, Russia started it, and it has very serious consequences uh, on our economy, on our society, and our security. 
And in this context, the fact that uh, China uh, continues to support uh, uh, Russia um, is an issue for us and, uh, and raise uh, further mistrust. And that also leads to a most recent decision uh, from uh, European Union to sanction specific entities in China and India who are contributing to uh, Russia's war efforts. So all this to say that um, I think we have reason to be pessimistic about the about the future of EU-China relation. We should also be optimistic in the sense the last EU-China summit was a bit better in terms of communication interaction than the previous one, uh, but still mistrust is, is there. And I want to, if I have two or three minutes left, left uh, Liza, I want to elaborate a bit on how China sees Europe today compared to how it uh, did see Europe under Hu Jintao, because I think there is significant evolution here is that um, from Beijing, Europe is not seen as a priority partner uh, anymore. It's quite clear. I'm not saying that it's not an important market for China. And as Professor Ding said, there is a, a strong emphasis on, on Chinese side to, to underline that uh, that Chinese market is key also for Europe and that if Europe does not uh, you know, uh, maintain a form of cooperation, it will suffer economically and even socially with ethnic group conflict and from a farmer being unhappy. But uh, from a Beijing perspective, I think China is ready to pay the price of further tension with Europe because whenever you analyze the key strategic document that China has put out in recent uh, months and years, it's key that China does not see us as priority partner. Again, we are an important market, but not priority partner. Some example, if you look at the concept paper of the Global Security Initiative that was uh, out in uh, February 2023, Africa is mentioned 14 times, Europe never. Uh, when you look at the concept paper uh, titled Global Community of Shared Future, China's Proposal and Action, that was released in September last year, uh, developing countries, the expression developing countries is mentioned 30, 16 times and Europe just one time, briefly, when uh, it's talking about connectivity and transport. In Wang Yi's speech at the Munich Security Conference um, about uh, 10 days ago, um, uh, he underlined China that should be a force, will be a force uh, for stability in promoting cooperation between major countries, I quote. But in this division of the word and in the mention of major countries, first of all, the US is mentioned, of course. Then Russia is mentioned as China's largest neighboring country and an important strategic partner. And then Europe is mentioned as third. So even in a conference in Europe, uh, on European territory, Europe is seen as, a, you know, in the categorization uh, as not the, the prime uh, uh, power to uh, to a major country to to um, to to mention. Of course, this may be just one speech, but all in all, whenever you analyze the foreign policy or relations strategy document, it's pretty clear that China considered the developing world, emerging world, or the global south, as we now often say, is a natural partner of China. That the U.S. is a top rival, pretty explicitly, even if now there is some resumption of communication and even uh, um, willingness to, to, to avoid escalation of tension in terms of by, by through this channel of communication. And in between, you have, so in the third group, they said developing emerging countries and global south, also Russia is a key, very key partner for China. But in between, between these two groups, you have Europe, which is seen as a gray zone by China. I'm simplifying, but for the sake of the analysis and the discussion, uh, we are put in the Western basket. So by default, we cannot be really trusted. And I refer to the mistrust, but we can be useful Westerner uh, <laughs> whenever, especially we promote strategic autonomy or so-called independent foreign policy, whenever this may also um, fuel transatlantic divergences useful Westerner when it comes to isolate uh, the main rival, which is the US. It sounds a bit uh, simplistic or Manichaean, but I think Mao's uh, three word theory uh, is really um, a legacy here. Even if the word has evolved, you have a division of the word, a three word division of, uh, of, uh, of the current global order in which uh, Europe is uh, useful, but not seen as a natural, uh, legitimate priority partner. The one that is most, uh, I mean, say natural and key today to China is Russia. Uh, 
and uh, and we have very um, various evidence of it. And this is not there is not it's not the, the main topic of the discussion. But I was very interested to read in the South China Morning Post three days ago a quote from uh, from yourself, or Professor Ding, saying that uh, alluding to the fact that Russia, in a sense, can be uh, an example. Um, because uh, it has provided uh, China many precious experience that we can learn from to deal with financial and economic sanctions in the future. So I found this uh, very interesting. If the quote is, is exact, huh? because sometimes journalists are misquoting, but if the quote is exact, the fact that you see Russia's behavior at time of sanction and her, her ability of Russia to bypass, to handle uh, this sanction and maintain a rather a good economic situation, in front of this sanction. I think it's pretty uh, interesting. And overall, I have the impression when we read the uh, joint uh, statement and uh, communication uh, following recent exchange between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping that the uh, Russia-China relationship is planned long term, independently of the evolution of the war in Ukraine and also independently of Europe's um, dissatisfaction with China's position. Uh, before Europe, the EU in particular, hoped that it could have economic leverage on China to push China to clarify its position towards following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but also to maybe initiate a distanciation towards its partner. But not only had Europe did not manage to channel China toward that direction, but on the contrary, China reinforced rapprochement, even if Europe remains an important market uh, to date. So all to say that um, I think I agree with you that uh, Ukraine war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a turning point also in the bilateral relationship. And um, the evolution of uh, the China-Russia relationship will necessarily continue to impact uh, China-EU uh, uh, EU member states' uh, relation. Alice, thank you so much. That was a very sobering assessment um, of the relationship. Um, I'd like to go back to a point that Professor Ding mentioned at the very end of uh, his intervention. And Alice, I'll, I'll come to you first, and then I'd like to hear from Professor Ding. It, and it's also a question actually from our audience is, you know, considering the relationship and considering where it is at this point in time, um, we have a lot of mistrust, um, there's a lot of tension. Are there any concrete examples of how we can rebuild that trust or are we just not at that point right now and maybe we will have to come back to it later on? Um, and what does that later on actually look like? Um, Alice, I know that's a pretty big question to throw at you, but uh, any silver linings? <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing, the thing is that being French and Professor Ding being a good French speaker, I mean, um, uh, Montesquieu, Montesquieu would say, uh, commerce a douce les mœurs, that, uh, you know, economic interdependence would, uh, I would say, lead to pacify, in a sense, uh, the world, or at least will lead to conflict avoidance or conflict pacification. But at this point in time, when I, th I think really uh, the I mean economic interdependence still exists very much, and Professor Ding has underlined that in his presentation. But it's not the prime shaper of uh, of foreign policy orientation and, and position, and uh, and it does not pacify the U-China relation. Uh, although interdependence is, is is here, so I think it. Uh, yeah, expecting that econ economic, you know, interest, mutual economic interest will naturally drive us back to, to you know, a, a trend of uh, cooperation uh, is uh, a bit uh, too optimistic. Um, what would really help is a more frank dialogue and discussion on most pressing issues. And some of uh, our audience, uh, I mean, raised, uh, I mean, identify these issues. One is uh, Ukraine and the other one is the Middle East. But on, on this, even at think tank level, we have good exchange, actually good friendly, I mean, discussion in a sense that we can meet and still, uh, I mean, online or in person and still exchange. But uh, the framing and the words that we use to describe the same conflict is totally different from the beginning. So straight from the beginning, it's like we are communicating in a parallel words that we are saying very different things. Uh, and uh, we refer to very different facts and that are not um, sometimes double checked or access the same way. So um, on, I, I must say on China's side, I, I saw, I've, I've seen an evolution. There was a willingness and that was a tradition on the Deng Xiaoping onwards and Jiang Zemin and Putin. There was a willingness to uh, try to understand the other side. 
and also it was very much present in Europe. But but that willingness has uh, has uh, I think is not present anymore. And um, I would say that maybe the business community itself uh, is is bringing uh, I would say a realistic account of uh, of issues on the ground. And maybe um, multi-layered dialogue uh, that that is enlarged to uh, um, non-state representative may help. But I'm pretty pessimistic. I'm maybe becoming a bit technical here. But uh, I think, yeah, more than ever, we need we need to exchange and we need to be frank about the mistrust. And uh, I think we need to go beyond. Um, Victimization, or basically, it's it's you, Europe, the fault, or it's you, it's you who are starting that, and uh, if you don't stop that, uh, it will not come back. Or and also, it, it should really stop. I think uh, uh, threatening, like if you don't do this, or if you don't cooperate economically with China, you will have uh, issues domestically. Uh, you will have social tension, etc. I think this 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 can be seen as a threat, and uh, it will not uh, bring Mr. trust back. Alice, thank you. Um, you 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 paint um, an interesting picture in the article that you wrote, I think, last year, where you talk a lot about this ambiguity gap and the challenge of ambiguity, and you you've mentioned that quite a bit um, here. Um, Professor Ding, I'd like to throw the same question to you in terms of concrete um, examples of how to overcome this this mistrust in the relationship. And, and a point that, that Alice um, mentioned uh, during the course of her intervention is trying to prioritize where that might be, because there is a long list of issues, um, but are there opportunities? Mm -hmm. I think that mainly if you wanted to improve our relationship, uh, we should not always look back uh, to, to try to find who is responsible for what. So that, that's completely nonsense. You cannot find the solution. We have to, based upon the current situation, we have to find a way out. We have to find a way out, so we have to try to find to provide some concrete solutions. So look at uh, the relationship between the United States and China. So the relation has been very tense, very, very difficult, difficult to manage. And, and while when the leaders of both countries realize that we almost we are running on the verge of collapse so they concluded that we have to do something and then they come together uh, lastly they met uh, in Los in san francisco and then they made uh, decisions to not to look back but to look forward and then they have found some solutions uh, to move forward. I think that this kind of attitude is pragmatic. It's very effective, efficient. We, between China and Europe, we should also find a way like this. This year, we, will, we, we are commemorating the 60th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between France and China. And Chinese leaders visibly were paying a visit to France and to other European countries. So that will be a good opportunity to relaunch our dialogue, to engage uh, both of us into uh, uh, and to, to try to find some uh, uh, understanding on those uh, efforts. Last year, when President Macron visited China, so there is some informal dialogue, informal conversation between Xi Jinping and Macron, especially in, in, in Guangzhou. So it shows that we can engage this kind of friendly discussion. Uh, and then we can talk about a lot of things. Don't um, look at this rhetoric, those official rhetoric, all these, uh, because those, we both, Xi Jinping and Macron, they have their domestic problems. They have their domestic audience. They have to talk to their domestic audience also. Don't look, uh, don't look at their declaration statements as such important uh, factor that could hamper our uh, diplomatic relations, our, our bilateral economy and the corporations. So we have to, to, to
to understand the other side needs. <laughs> you have to put yourself into other space because every political leaders have their own domestic concerns. And they sometimes they say things that is only domestic concern or domestically related. But sometimes at the international level, those statements are interpreted according to the local needs or to local interpretations. So you have to understand uh, the domestic reason of these statements. So nowadays, even we can better understand, for example, Biden's statement about China. And we see that sometimes Biden or Trump statements about China are because they're based upon the domestic consideration, not because of China but because of the, the, the domestic audience. So and then if we can consider these, we can put ourselves to the place of others and we can have a better understanding of others' statements or others' behavior. And then we can probably find a, a solution out of this mess. Because really uh, it's not a threat. It's a pragmatic analysis of a situation. If we can not get out of these, we stick to this logic of geopolitical calculus. We can never come out of this crisis. The world is in crisis. The world is in crisis. If we, we cannot handle this crisis well, we will be dragged into a, a deep, Stagflation, a deep stagflation, all these macroeconomy adjustments will completely lose the efficiency and lose the effectiveness. And then we, we cannot get out of this. We are used to the benefits of the globalization. Well, when the deglobalization comes, so we have to face to this new reality and then try to uh, alleviate the pressure uh, of a stagflation over or, or, or development. That's my analysis. Thank you, um, Professor Deng. Um, Alice, you want to come in on this now? I, we've, we've got about four minutes left, and um, there are a couple of questions that have come in from the online audience. Um, so I'll just I just want to touch on them, a couple of them. Maybe you could think through those as we uh, begin to wrap up the session. So, you know, one area of potential cooperation, and I think this is a bit of a long shot, but uh, maybe one of you can take that is on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, and then another uh, question that came up, and I was hoping we could touch on this a little bit, but uh, we've unfortunately almost run out of time is the battle of narratives that's not just playing out in um, in Europe and in China, but also in the global south, which is, Alice, you mentioned, this is the next battleground. Um, so yeah, if I could ask you two minutes each so that we can wrap up on time, um, uh -huh. pick and choose which one you want to want to handle, because I realize it's also quite late for Professor Ding in, in Beijing. Who wants to go first? Alice. <laughs> okay, very briefly. <laughs> um... Uh, on Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I don't see really um, this as a topic of convergence or pot potential cooperation because actually positions are very uh, diverging. Beijing position is very different from uh, EU's position, from most member states' position. And uh, in that regard, the five, the five points uh, declaration that uh, Beijing has uh, shaped on the topic is very general and has not blamed that from the beginning Hamas behavior, uh, which is also a prerequisite, I think, for most member states also to, to move on. So um, I would say Beijing position on, on, I mean, from the 7th of October is less ambiguous than it has been after Russia's invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, or more click cut in a, say, in a sense, it's, it's pretty one side. In that sense, it would be hard for China to to play the role of a mediator uh, along with uh, Europe if it also tries to play so. On the battle of narrative, um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I would say, um, yes, that the mistrust has been fueled by the battle of narrative that has been uh, mentioned. And really the wolf wire diplomacy, or whatever you call it, the constant Western bashing 
uh, in violent term, uh, fueled by young diplomats, which are using sometimes expression that we heard during the Mao era, um, has uh, left uh, wounds and uh, scars uh, in the bilateral relationship. So now we see some kind of softening of the communication targeting Europe and part of a charm offensive, especially towards France following uh, Macron's visit, but also at EU level. But it's a superficial softening. Whenever we go deep down into you know, uh, issues uh, of common interests and uh, we try to address these issues from uh, Ukraine to the Middle East, we have very diverging views and it's very hard to, to, to find a common ground. So I wonder if, I mean, I, I hope that the constant Western bashing and Europe bashing will be over, but um, I take away from this event that it's not necessarily the case, it's just a softening of the tone. So if there is a change of approach towards Europe and um, maybe that, that would contribute to uh, reinforcement of uh, trust. Thank you, Alice. Professor Ding, the closing remarks are yours. Okay, um, two minutes. <laughs> so I will just really be very brief. So I, I wanted to take advantage of this last opportunity to answer uh, Ali's uh, question about how important is Europe in China's grand strategy. I think that Europe is still very important in China's grand strategy, but less important really than the global south because the global south is becoming uh, it, so. On the bet on, on the, the question of the, the battle of narratives, it's also if you look at the Western media, as the Western public opinions, so uh, the narratives is very important. The China's description, Chinese definition is very important. Well, if you you ask questions to some South countries, those South countries public uh, uh, opinion leaders or something like that, they have different. Uh, perspective about China and these uh, so-called systemic rivalries uh, between Europe and, and China, between all these. Global South countries have a positive view of China's uh, investment in, your, your, in those countries, uh, Chinese behavior in the global arena. So uh, it's a total difference. That's why uh, those South global South countries is becoming a, a major market for China also. Uh, those countries, if you look at since the pandemic, Chinese export towards those global South countries is overtaking Chinese export to Europe, United States and Japan, to those uh, so-called uh, Western countries. So to that extent, so uh, Global South is becoming more and more important for China. So in China's grand strategy, so Global South is very, very important. So. Alice, you've got a quick two finger on that. You're, all, you're, you're muted, we can't hear you. I just one line to follow up on what Professor Ding said. Uh, China's grand strategy can also, I think, be qualified as a French shoring because uh, President Xi Jinping talked about uh, Peng Yuan, a circle of friends, enlarging mm -hmm. China's circle of friends. And uh, it's really clear that China wants to, to build uh, an alternative global order by uh, reinforcing partnership within the global south. And a core pillar of this partnership is, uh, is, is Russia. And I think Indeed, I'm very glad that actually we converge in the analysis that uh, Global South is more important than Europe in the eyes of Beijing today. Thank you, Alice. Um, I want to thank both of you. That was fascinating. Um, as you said, I think we both we all agree that there's lots of things to be pessimistic about, um, but there are some silver linings. Um, continued frank dialogue. Um, Alice, you mentioned this as being very important. Um, and Global South is going to be something to watch in the in the future. Um, thank you again for, for joining us. I'd like to thank our online audience for, for listening in and tuning in. And we'll see you again next time. So bye-bye. Bye-bye.